Hey everybody and welcome to a uh, live stream from Northeast Christian Apologetics. Welcome to our Monday night book study. Um, Monday nights at 6 p.m. where we read a book and uh, go through and discuss things that are, are going on in the chapter. Today we are reading through and continuing our study of tactics. Um, tactics, uh, well, you know, before we jump into that, I just, just want to say I hope everyone's having a, a good week and I hope that everyone's having a good day. And, and just to let you guys know, um, I had to keep my daughter home uh, tonight and uh, she's upstairs um, and uh, she's just turned five this week. Uh, well, actually, last week. <laughs> so she just turned five, and uh, but still, uh, a boundary recognition isn't a, a, a something that she's uh, super clear on still. And uh, so she's, I told her that I'm going to be doing this, uh, but it may very well be the case that she comes down and gives us a little visit. Um, so uh, just uh, be patient with that. Um, so we're continuing our study of tactics. Reading through tactics uh, that's written by Greg Kokel. Greg Kokel uh, runs a ministry called Stand to Reason. Really good uh, Christian ministry. Definitely check him out. Um, as always, you can get this uh, book at Amazon.com as well as Christian Books. Uh, I have not updated these uh, pictures recently, so those prices may not be accurate, but uh, the rating is. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a really good book, really useful for um, anyone, not just uh, Christians, but also to for anyone who wants to have a conversation with people. But this is uh, a book written for and geared towards Christians. Um, no surprise, since this is a uh, Northeast Christian Apologetics, we are looking uh, to strengthen the faith of uh, Christians and get this uh, content uh, available. <clears throat> Um, uh, Sasha says that she's coming to grab uh, Sala now. Uh, we love seeing her. Yeah. You know, uh, I do <laughs> get a lot of positive feedback when when Sala shows up. Um, my five year old, when she uh, shows up on camera, people are like, "Oh, she's so cute," and she is. She is. But uh, I am trying to get this uh, this uh, stuff out to as many people as possible, um, and. Uh, and one way that you can help me in this endeavor is uh, by subscribing to the channel. Uh, also liking the comment or liking the video and uh, commenting and sharing it uh, on your social media, inviting people out to our Monday night uh, book study um, really helps, you know? Um, so uh, I hope that you guys have been uh, um, studying uh, the Bible and studying apologetics and uh, prayerfully considering uh um, things uh, that trouble you in your life. Uh, um, lately, we've been having conversations at uh, Castle Church related to, um, and if you follow us on Facebook, then you see this. Uh, but uh, you see, um, at Castle Church, we've been talking about uh, like how a claim saying that Christianity is anti science or anti intellectual, and we've been um, breaking down those uh, barriers, addressing those comments and concerns. Um, and, uh, and I hope that you've been, uh, analyzing the, your own barriers to belief. Like what is preventing you from having a deeper relationship with God? What's uh, preventing you from having a deeper understanding of Christianity? What's uh, something that troubles you and uh, causes you to doubt and, uh, really analyze those and then seek out answers to those questions. What? They seek out uh, books that are written by Christians that address those topics of concern that you have. Really, uh, uh, don't be afraid to really investigate matters that uh, cause you you to doubt Christianity. All right. So, um, but anyway, um, let's go ahead and uh, and just as a reminder, uh, as always in, in a lot of my videos, I say that this. Uh, uh, these Monday night book studies are kind of like a, a react channel kind of deal instead of reacting to books or correction instead of reacting to uh, videos and music we're reacting to books um, so I will be reading the books and providing you my insights along the way uh, do not hesitate to provide your own feedback and to uh, uh, let me know what you think and ask questions and we can address them as we go along all right so 
Let's go ahead and over to the reading. All right, so chapter 16, Jess the Facts, ma'am. Um, all right, so uh, Kokel says, uh, there is an old TV uh, police uh, drama called Dog... Or, <laughs> there's an old uh, police uh, drama called Dragnet that you may have heard of but probably have never seen unless you watch reruns, really old reruns. Uh, two lines from Dragnet are still remembered to this day. The first is, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. The second is, just the facts, ma'am. Detective Joe Friday's trademark request of whomever he questions as a witness. Just the facts, ma'am, is an easy tactic to use. It requires no cleverness or deft maneuvering. Only two things are necessary. The first is an awareness that many challenges to Christianity are based on bad information. These objections uh, can be overcome by a simple repeat appeal to the facts. Syndicated talk show host uh, Dennis Prager tells his callers, first tell the truth, then give your opinion. His point, an opinion is only as good as the information it's based on. Bad information results in bad opinions. The second requirement is that you need to know the facts. If you do, you can beat the objection. It is not an absolute requirement for this tactic because sometimes you can spot a wrong answer even though you don't know the right one. But knowing the right answer is central to using just the facts, ma'am. And often the information is just a few keystrokes away. So religion kills. Uh, let me uh, give you an example of a popular challenge to Christianity that is not based on fact, though many think it is. The protest goes something like this. Uh, religion is the greatest source of evil in the world. More wars have been fought and more blood has been shed in the name of God than for any other cause. This myth is likely the most widely believed urban legend about religion. Atheist Christopher Hitchens' popular attack on theism is titled uh, God is not great. How religion poisons everything. Uh, fellow atheist uh, Sam Harris trades on the same fiction. In the end, uh, faith, religion, terror, and the future of reason. Uh, religious faith, he writes, is the, the most prolific source of violence in our history. And um, in the past, I've actually had uh, debates with uh, people regarding whether or not uh, religion poisons everything. Um, my problem with uh, that statement it should be pretty clear uh, that it's way too broad. It's way too broad of a statement. You know, like uh, you, you can't just say religion poisons everything because it, um, not all religions poison things. So, but you can say that there are certain religions out there that do poison things. And so you have to analyze each individual religion based off of its merits, based off of its cardinal teachings based off of what it uh, provides to humanity. You know, it's it's not enough to just say religion poisons everything. You have to analyze each religion itself. Um, also, the statement itself, like religion poisons everything, is actually a poisonous statement. It's a poisonous belief because uh, most people on earth are religious people, um, varying in degrees, uh, obviously, but uh, most people have some sort of religious belief. And if you're saying that religion poisons everything, then you're saying that a closely cherished or a very cherished belief of most people alive today are is, is just poison, when it's actually not <laughs> for a lot of people, you know? Um, and so that's actually like a so's... Uh, Disunity, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not necessary in order to, um, it doesn't promote human flourishing, things of that nature. So definitely, I definitely discourage that kind of uh, um, belief. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, Coco continues. Now, one might point out that even if this were the case, it is not entirely clear what conclusions about religion would be justified from that data. One couldn't properly conclude that God does not exist or that Jesus is not the Savior or that the Bible is not reliable, simply by citing acts of violence done in the name of God or Christ. Since oppression and mayhem are neither religious duties for Christians nor logically or logical implications of the teachings of Jesus, violence done in the name of Christ cannot be laid at his door. This conduct might tell you something about people. It tells you nothing about God or the gospel. 
So there are logical problems with this complaint. It doesn't nullify any particular claim or any particular religion, especially Christianity. But the bigger problem is that this charge is simply not true. Though it is easy to characterize religion as a bloodthirsty enterprise replete with witch hunts, crusades, and jihads, uh, the fact to the facts point a or paint a different picture. Religion has not caused more wars and bloodshed than anything else in history. In their massive three-volume encyclopedia of wars, researchers Charles Phillips and uh, Alan Ak uh, Axelrod show that uh, of the 1,763 wars they chronicle over the last five millennia, only 123, less than 7%, were motivated by religion. And religion played no part in the two greatest military conflagrations in history, World War I with 16.5 million dead, and World War II with 60 to 80 million perishing. You know, uh, there was uh, more bloodshed in the 20th century than all the other centuries combined. Coco continues, uh, the historical facts uh, show that significantly greater evil has resulted from a denial of God than from pursuit of God. In the 20th century alone, Dennis Prager notes, more innocent uh, people have been murdered, tortured, and enslaved by secular ideologies, Nazism and communism, than by all religions in history. Uh, grab an older copy of the Guinness uh, Book of World Records and turn to the category judicial, uh, subheading crimes, mass killings. You'll find that carnage of unimaginable proportions resulted not from religion, but from institutionalized atheism. More than 66 million Soviets wiped out under the communist leadership of Lenin, Stalin, and Khrushchev. Uh, uh, between uh, 32 million and 61 million Chinese killed under communist regimes since 1949, one-third of the 8 million comers, and uh, two, uh, 2 2.7 million people killed between 1975 and 1979 under the communist uh, rogue. All right, so the, the greatest evil has not to come from people zealous for God. It has come from people who are convinced there is no God they must answer to. The correlation uh, between a high body count and atheistic uh, total, uh, totalitarianism is not an accident. I presume Mr. Harris locks his door at, <laughs> doors at night, but it's not because he's concerned about deeply religious people in his neighborhood. People who care about, care what God thinks characteristic, characteristically control their behavior because they are convinced God is watching. Atheists have no such concern. So atheists uh, with a significant power have no such constraint. I certainly am not suggesting that all atheists promote the kind of genocide I've described. Most oppose it. I am saying, though, that there is a natural kinship to between a particular worldviews and behaviors that logically follow from them. No atheism, uh, no atheism, doesn't dictate genocide. The worldview allows it, though. No moral principle inherent to atheism prohibits it, simply because there is no moral principles inherent to, to atheism to begin with. All right, yeah, so this is a, something to note here. Um, it, it should also be noted that, like, atheism is not, like, a worldview, you know? Uh, atheism is a, just a particular stance, a, a belief that's a, a belief or lack of belief or an anti or a non-belief regarding the existence of God, you know? So the, um, um, there are, as we mentioned in, when, in our on guard book study, there are implications, moral, imp there could very well be moral implications with regard to the status of objective moral values and duties. Um, if God doesn't exist and that's been argued for, um, but, uh, the Bible does say, you know, that the, the fool says in his heart that there is no God. And in the context of that, uh, by a biblical passage, it's referring to people who sin and, uh, people who sin, um, do so because uh, they imagine, or at least they convince themselves for the time being that God doesn't exist, you know, and it's a foolish stance to take. And uh, so people 
behave uh, in accordance with their sinful nature um, because they have convinced themselves that either God's not watching or that he's not going to um, take action against them or that he doesn't exist, that kind of stuff. All right, so um, Coco continues, uh, ironically, in his warning about the risks of religious belief, Sam Harris makes both of my points simultaneously. One, there is a kinship between dangerous ideas and dangerous conduct. And two, the dangerous ideas of atheism easily gives way to deadly oppression. Listen, the link between belief and uh, behavior raises the stakes considerably. Point one, some propositions are so dangerous that it may be ethical to kill people for believing them. Point two, there is, in fact, no talking to some people. If they cannot be captured and they often cannot otherwise tolerate uh, people, uh, may be uh, justified in killing them in self-defense. Uh, so kill people as an act of self-defense simply for their religious beliefs. You see what I'm getting at. Uh, though Christopher Hitchens uh, titled his chapter on religious violence, uh, Religion Kills, the simple fact is that uh, non-religion kills too, more often, more efficiently, and in greater numbers. So uh, precision is persuasive. I want you to notice something about the facts I cited in the examples about conduct caused by secular ideologies. Now, they were as... Uh, they were as precise as I could make them without being cumbersome. I gave specific details with exact numbers and clear-cut dates. And precision is an important element of just the facts, man, because of a basic principle of persuasion. When citing facts in your defense, precise claims are always more persuasive than general ones. Uh, though your memory may not always be up to the task, mine certainly isn't, uh, try to use specific information rather than general references when you, whenever you can. When you communicate with a factual precision, you convince your listener that you know what you're talking about. Saying thousands died in the terror attacks of 9-11 is not as compelling as saying that uh, 2,977 human beings were buried beneath the rubble of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and, and entombed in the field in the field in Pennsylvania on September 11, of 2001. Each bit of precision, the number 2,977, the date September 11, 2001, the locations of the attacks add force to your facts. It may take longer to say it, but with proper delivery, it is much more compelling. This kind of exactness can be a powerful persuader. I was once involved in a head-to-head -head encounter of sorts with a Pulitzer Prize-winning historian, Gary Wills, uh, before San Francisco's Liberal Commonwealth Club, an encounter that was taped for national broadcasts on NPR. In his uh, opening salvo on the topic Christianity in America, Professor Wills uh, disputed the idea that the founding fathers of our republic were Christians. They were not Christians, he, he claimed, but deists. The microphone was then passed to me. Fortunately, I had specific details at hand to make my point. The phrase founding fathers is a proper noun, I explained. It refers to a specific group, the delegates of the Constitutional Convention. There were other important players, but not, all, but not in attendance. But these 55 made up the core. Then I cited from memory as best I could the following facts, which are a matter of public record. Among the delegates were 28 Episcopalians, 8 Presbyterians, 7 Congregationalists, 2 Lutherans, 2 Dutch Reformed, 2 Methodists, 2 Reformed Catholics, 1 Unknown, and only 3 Deists, Williamson, Wilson, and Franklin. The convention took place at a time when the when church membership usually entailed sworn adherence to strict doctrinal creeds. Uh, this tally proves that 51 of the 55 members of the Constitutional Convention, virtually 93 percent of the most influential group group of men shaping the political underpinnings of our nation, were Christians, not deists. Virtually every person involved in the founding of uh, in the founding enterprise of the United States was a Protestant whose denominational affiliation could be characterized in today's terms as evangelical or even fundamentalist. When I was finished, I set my microphone down and waited, bracing for the rebuttal uh, from my learned opponent, but he said nothing. After a few moments of awkward silence, uh, the moderator moved on to a new topic. 
Dr. Wills had his facts wrong. Mine were not only correct, but also precise, adding tremendous persuasive power to my rebuttal. And and so, like, when the importance of this is, especially with regard to, like, um, especially with regard to uh, a conversation that you know that you're going to have. You know, like, uh, when you know that you're going to be in a debate or having a conversation of a sp- with a specific person um, on a specific thing, then definitely study up on it, especially if you know that there's going to be people watching. You know, make sure that you've studied uh, the the topic in depth and that you have uh, memorized uh, these kinds of things. It really does improve your your standing with the audience. So following a plan, Coco continues, uh, challenges uh, to Christianity that fail because of faulty facts may seem difficult to spot at first, especially if you're not well versed in the issue in question. But the task becomes much easier if you have a plan, a series of steps to guide your effort. For just the facts, ma'am, I use uh, the same two step correction, uh, I use the same two step plan whenever I have I am having a conversation or doing a detailed analysis of a book or article. First, ask, what is the claim? This uh, may seem like an obvious initial step, but you'll be surprised at how often we charge ahead without having a clear fix on a target. Take a moment to isolate the precise point being made. Your first Columbo question helps here. Write it down in unambiguous terms if you need to. Sometimes the claim is clear, but not always. Assertions are often implicit or hidden under a layer of rhetoric and linguistic maneuvering. Pay careful attention to get an accurate sense of what the person is asserting. A piece written by a student in the university newspaper claimed that pro-lifers have no right to oppose abortion unless they are willing to care for the children born to mothers in crisis pregnancies. Notice that the author was making two assertions here. The first was the obvious moral point, which was easily dispatched. In my written response to the paper, I pointed out that it simply does not follow that because a person objects to killing innocent children, he is obligated to care for those who survive. Imagine how bizarre it would sound to argue you have no right to stop me from beating my wife unless you're willing to marry her. Clearly, the offender is not off the hook simply because others won't step in to take his place. Implicit in the challenge, though, was a second assertion, the claim that pro-lifers are not to doing anything for pregnant women who carry their babies to term. Thus, the student felt justified in citing or criticizing the pro-life movement. This brings us to the second step in our plan. Once the assertion is clear or clear and clear, ask, is the claim factually accurate? Sometimes answering this question takes a little investigation. A short trip to the Internet revealed that at the time, there were roughly 4,000 national and international pro-life service providers dedicated to the well-being of mothers in crisis pregnancies who chose life for their children. They provide medical aid, housing, baby clothing, cribs, food, help with adoption, even post-abortion counseling services, all at no cost Amazingly, there were more crisis pregnancy centers in the co- in the country than abortion clinics. A quick check to the of the local phone directory showed that there were ten such centers right in the same city as the university. In my response, I pointed out to each of these details to show that besides being flawed in its reasoning, this student's objections had no factual basis. So. <laughs> uh, that that's uh, pretty uh, pretty shocking, <laughs> to be honest with you. It's like wow, um, you really need to make sure that your ducks are in a row when you're having these kinds of conversations, especially when you're submitting an article. All right, so Coco continues, uh, cracking the code. Um, I followed my two-step plan when evaluating the historical claims of the blockbuster novel, The Da Vinci Code, whose uh, broadside on Christianity and the Bible created a public sensation and tremendous turmoil for Christians a number of years ago. Uh, And it still does today. And I still have conversations where people's main understanding of how the Bible was formed is through the, the... the process or the the historical fiction presented in the Da Vinci Code, it is. <laughs> it's annoying having to rebut this so often. 
Anyway, Coco continues. Uh, first, uh, I isolated the claims. Uh, the author, Dan Brown, made it uh, simple in most cases by stating his uh, contentions clearly. Here are some of them. In the first three centuries, the warring between Christians and pagans threatened to rend Rome in two. The uh, doctrine that uh, Jesus is the Son of God was fabricated for political reasons at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325 and affirmed for a close vote. Or correction, affirmed by a closed vote. Close vote. Um, Constantine arranged for all go uh, Gospels depicting Jesus as a mere mortal to be gathered up and destroyed. The uh, Dead Sea Scrolls found in a cave new, near Qumran in the 1950s confirmed the fabrication. Thousands of uh, Christ's followers wrote accounts of uh, Jesus' life. And these uh, evolved through countless translations, editions, and revisions. History has never had a definitive version. Because I now had specific items to assess, my job was much easier. The first challenge was simple. Even a cursory analysis of this period of history reveals that there were no wars between pagans and Christians, and for a very good reason. Jesus' followers had neither armies nor the will to resist. Instead, they considered it a privilege to be martyred for Christ. They wouldn't even f fight tormentors like D uh, Diocletian. Who executed uh, or Diocletian, who uh, executed uh, Christians by the thousands uh, just twenty years before Constantine? The, con uh, the Council of Nicaea was not an obscure event in history. We have extensive, extensive uh, records of the proceedings written by those who were actually there: Eusebius of Caesarea and Athanasius, deacon of Alexandria. Uh, Two things stand out in those accounts that pertain to Brown's claims. First, no one at Nicaea considered Jesus to be a mere mortal, not even Arius, whose errant views made the council necessary. Everyone in the discussion believed Jesus was the Son of God. They disagreed on what that title meant. Consequently, the question of Christ's deity was the reason for the council, not merely the result of it. After a pitched debate, the final uh, vote wasn't close at all. It was a landslide of uh, 318 bishops, only two, the Egyptian uh, Theonus and uh, Secundus, uh, refused to concur. The council affirmed uh, what had been taught since the beginning. Jesus was not a mere man. He was uh, God the Son. All right, so... Um, yeah, there could be a lot said about all this, you know, like, yeah, um, you know, it, this is the Arian heresy, whether or not uh, Jesus is uh, homoousia with the father or homoousia with the father. And uh, these uh, Greek words, homoousia, meaning uh, of the same substance uh, versus homoousia, which is uh, of similar substance. And um the Arians believed that uh, Jesus was uh, of a similar substance with God and that he was a, a created being um, uh, that is divine, but not of the same kind of caliber as uh, as God, you know. And so uh, the Trinitarians ended up winning out to, it, at the council, but uh, the Arians actually <laughs> came back— uh, in, uh, to with a vengeance and uh, were a dominant view for a little while. And uh, as a matter of fact, the Athanasius of Alexandria, um, he actually ended up getting exiled uh, a few times because of it. Um, a very interesting history. It definitely has nothing to do with uh, the Christians and the pagans going to war or things like that. But there was unrest so with regard to Christianity. There was a lot of debates about this Arian heresy. And uh, Constantinople did call for the council, um, but uh, he, the reason why he wanted it uh, was in order to get the get it just settled. You know, he, he didn't want any division in his uh, empire. He didn't want it to crumble under any of any kind of division with regard to something as what he saw as trivial as uh, the the ontology of Jesus. You know, it, what kind of son is he? He didn't care either way. You know, he didn't. It, he just wanted it settled um, in order to preserve unity. It's ironic though that. Uh, 
his fear about uh, this kind of uh, controversy causing disunity in his kingdom was not what actually ended up driving a wedge in his kingdom, but actually his decision to move the capital of Rome from Rome, uh, the capital of his empire from Rome to Constantinople. That actually is the major reason why there 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 was so much division in in his in his empire, and it was brought about by him. Um, ironic. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Coco continues uh, regarding the uh, famous uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Br Brown uh, might be forgiven for not uh, getting the date right. The first scrolls were discovered in the 1940s, not not the 1950s. There is no excuse, however, for another misstep. The Dead Sea Scrolls say nothing of Jesus. There were no Gospels in Qumran. Not one shred or shard mentions his name. Uh, Brown's assertion is a complete fabrication. As for the rest of the claims, I want to, to let you in on a little secret. Answering the second question, is the, the claim factually accurate? It does not always require investigation. I mentioned earlier that sometimes it is possible to spot a wrong answer even, it, even when you do not know the right one. Here's how. Uh, before beginning any research, uh, first ask, does anything about the assertion seem suspicious or unlikely on its face? Uh, for example, early in the Da Vinci Code, Brown claims that over a period of 300 years, the Catholic Church burned 5 million witches at the stake <laughs> in Europe around the 5th century. Uh, I was immediately suspicious of this fact, so I uh, took out my uh, calculator and did the math. Rome would have... Would have uh, would have to burn forty five women a day every single day nonstop for three hundred years. Um, that's a lot of firewood. Furthermore, a quick internet search revealed that the population in Europe at the time was about fifty million. If half were female, twenty five million, and half of those were adults, uh, twelve point five million, uh, then something like forty percent of the entire female population perished at the hands of the Vatican. That's more carnage than the Black Plague in 1347, which killed only a third. Let's just say this seems highly unlikely. Many of Dan Brown's other claims uh, can be quickly dispatched using the same technique. Um, if the deity of Christ was a was an idea invented by Constantine and foreign to Christian followers who viewed him as a mere mortal, what explains the close vote in at Nicaea? If the early records of uh, Jesus' life are so corrupted and compromised with countless translations, editions, and revisions, and if history was never has never had a definitive version, from where does uh, Brown derive his reliable, authentic, unimpeachable biogra biographical information about Jesus? How does uh, Brown know that thousands of Jesus' followers wrote accounts of his life if the great bulk of these records was destroyed? This is the classic problem uh, for conspiracy theorists. If all the evidence was er eradicated, how do they know it was there in the first place? How was it uh, physically possible for Constantine to gather up all the handwritten copies from every nook and cranny of the Roman Empire in the 4th century and destroy the vast majority of them? Each of these difficulties becomes obvious when you take a moment to answer if anything about the claim seems suspicious or implausible on its face. Granted, sometimes unlikely things turn out to be true. When that's the case, though, the evidence has to be clear and convincing. Usually, this question can save you some sleuthing. Whatever the uh, latest uh, bestseller cri uh, criticizing Christianity happens to be at the moment, use our two steps to do your own uh, evaluation of its assertions. So something to note here is that, uh, you know, it says that the, the early records of Jesus were so corrupted and compromised, you know, like a, a big portion of uh, biblical studies is textual criticism. And uh, textual criticism analyzes, especially like source criticism. Source criticism is uh, used to, to, uh, to try to understand what the, uh, the original text said. You know, and uh, the 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 manuscripts of the Bible, we literally have over 5,000 manuscripts that are written in the original Koine Greek. And uh, the similarities between them is uh, 
considering that it was written by humans, you know, copied by hand by humans is uh, pretty astonishing, you know. Um, even uh, the skeptic and the, and the scholar that's most well-known regarding textual criticism is uh, Bart Ehrman. And uh, even Bart Ehrman says that even with all the textual variants that we, that we see in the manuscripts, not a single cardinal Christian teaching is impacted, you know. Um, all the cardinal Christian te uh, teachings are robustly um, witnessed in the manuscripts. Okay, so there's just no concern about these kinds of the cor corrupt and compromised to the point of like we can't possibly know. Um, what what Bart Ehrman himself actually um, relies heavily on is uh, the fact that we don't have the actual originals. So there's a gap between the original and the earliest manuscripts that we have, and then in and in that gap, that's when Ehrman says, you know, like these are where we this is where we have really no idea. Um, uh, but it's unfounded, you know, like if over the course of a uh, thousand years that uh, you have uh, this, uh, um, stability of this, of the manuscripts or of the text, it lends credibility to believe that the stability has persisted throughout the entire time <laughs> that the manuscript was in circulation, you know, like it's uh, it's not unreasonable to believe all right, so anyway, um, Coco continues with abortion and homicide. Uh, here's another challenge that can be overcome by a single appeal to facts. Uh, some denounce the use of the word murder to describe abortion. And yet this language is consistent with the laws in nearly two-thirds of the states in the Union, at least uh, in one-third, or correction, at least in one regard. In the, in the California statutes under the, the category Crimes Against the Person, uh, statute 187, uh, murder is defined this way. Um, murder is the unlawful killing of a human being or a fetus with malice of for forethought. Emphasis added. After the definition, we find among the exceptions. This section shall not uh, apply to any person who commits an act with results which results in death if uh, of a fetus if the act was solicited, aided, abetted, and consented by the to by the mother of the fetus. This exception in the um, uh, California statute is troubling. Uh, the moral principle underlying all homicide statutes is that human beings have innate worth. Value is not derived from something outside of the individual. It is intrinsic to who they are. That's why destroying a human being is the most serious of crimes. If the intrinsic value of unborn human beings qualifies them for protection under homicide statutes, why is something extrinsic like the mother's choice relevant? How does this the mere consent of the mother change the innate value of the human, the little human being inside her? Fetal homicide statutes like California's are odd because the only difference between legal abortion and punishable homicide is the consent of the mother. However, one answers uh, this question, two facts remain. One, abortion is illegal in states like California. Two, apart from the stipulated exceptions, killing the unborn is homicide. Those who do so have been prosecuted for murder. On the use of the word murder to describe abortion, then pro-lifers are not extreme. Labeling abortion that way may not always be rhetorically wise, but it is not inaccurate. It agrees with the rationale of the statuses, or the correction, the statutes of the majority of states in this country. Unborn children are valuable human beings due to the same protection do the same protection as the rest of us. The problem is not with pro-life rhetoric, but with inconsistent laws. So just the context, ma'am. Resolving a challenge by appealing to the facts works with uh, scriptural issues, too. And here's an example. I have been asked why God prohibits killing in the Ten Commandments, but then commands killing when the Jews take Canaan. That sounds like a contradiction. The contradiction is dispatched by pointing out a simple fact. The Sixth Commandment does not read, you shall not kill, but rather, you shall not murder. Uh, there are different words for each in Hebrew just as in English, for good reason. 
there is a moral distinction between justified killing, killing in self-defense, for example, and unjustified killing, murder. God prohibits the second, not the first. The scriptural facts show that there is no contradiction. In my debate with New Age author Deepak Chopra, he made an unusual statement about the text of the New Testament. He claimed that the uh, King James Version was the, the 18th century or 19th or correction, the 18th or 19th iteration of the Bible since the year 313. This uh, comment reflected, I think, the idea that people that the idea many people have that the New Testament has gone through series of translations and re retranslations iterations before finally settling into the English versions we have today. A simple appeal to the facts uh, was all I needed to dispatch Dr. Chopra's challenge. All current to English translations of the Bible start with the manuscripts written in the original language, Greek, in the case of the New Testament, which are then translated directly into English. Instead of uh, multiple iterations, there is only one step in language from the original Greek to our English versions and th and this is how it is with all of our english yeah all of our english versions you know whether it be the niv the esv the net you know the king james version the new king james version the only difference is is kind of like the um um the the translation methodology being used some of them are more literal like the king james version is, is more literal or the rsv is more literal or the some of the some of the translations are take liberties, you know, like the New Living Translation. Um, so, and also when when translating uh, the Bible, it, it depends on the manuscripts being used. Like with the King James Version and the New King James Version, they use the Textus Receptus, um, which is widely considered nowadays to not be the best manuscripts. Um, so most people nowadays, like the ESV, the NIV, the um, the NET kind of use a uh, a reasoned eclecticism um, where they uh, reason which manus which uh, manuscripts provide the most reasonable original reading, and then they translate that reading into the English. Um, some translations just go with the majority text. Like if the majority of the text say this particular phrase, then that's what's used. Uh, but there's a lot that goes into all this. There's a lot that goes into all this. And um, it's a, a it's a very, I think it's a very interesting field of study. All right, so uh, Coco continues. A simple appeal to the facts was all I needed to dispatch Dr. Chopra's challenge. All, all right, so um, the original Greek to our English versions. Okay, so he continues. Here's another example of applying just the facts, ma'am, to a Bible passage that is almost universally misunderstood. Do not judge so that you will not be judged, Matthew 7, 1. This is a verse everybody knows and quotes when convenient. Even though they do not care about less convenient things, the Bible has to say on other issues. Jesus qualified this command, though, in a way that most do not. Uh, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Matthew 7, 3 and 5. A closer look at the facts of the context shows that Jesus did not condemn all judgments, only hypocritical ones. Arrogant condemnations characterized by disdain and condescension. Not all judgments are of this sort, though, so not all judgments are condemned. In this passage, Jesus encourages... A different sort of judgment once the hypocrisy has been dealt with. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Emphasis added. There are two other kinds of judging that are commanded in Scripture. Judgments that are judicial in nature are proper when done by the proper authorities. Judges judge. They pass sentence. That's their job. Uh, church discipline is of this sort. Paul specifically commands us to judge believers. God will judge the world in his time, 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13. Now, Jesus himself did not come initially for this kind of judgment. He offers mercy, not justice. But he will certainly return with this kind of judgment since he was appointed by the Father for that task. Judgments that, uh, that are assessments. 
appraisals of right or wrong, wise or foolish, accurate or inaccurate, rational or irrational, are also commanded. Uh, Jesus' instructions in that passage in that same passage, do not uh, give what is holy to dogs. Matthew 7, 6 requires this kind of evaluation. What is holy? Who are the dogs? Peter reminds us to be of sound judgment since the end of all things is near. 1 Peter 4, 7. Some assessments are moral. Paul commands this kind of uh, judgment in some circumstances. Do not uh, participate in unfruitful deeds of uh, darkness, but instead give, uh, but instead even expose them. Ephesians 5:11. Jesus said to make uh, such assertions not according to appearance, but by righteous standards. John 7:24. He chastises the Jews for their failures here. Why do you why do you not even uh, why do you not even on your own initiative initiative judge what is right Luke 12:57 a judicial action a, a factual assessment a hypocritical condemnation are all judgments only the third is disqualified by Jesus the first two are virtues in their proper setting and are therefore commanded by scripture there are uh, those are the scriptural facts all right so let's back up here um, all right, so what we need to do here is highlight <laughs> uh, from here and see and just go until the end of this passage. We're going to highlight all of that. All right, make sure you highlight that in your book. Okay, this is really important. All right, this kind of stuff comes up all the time, and uh. Kokel gives us some really good insight on uh, on judgment, how it's to be applied, what Scripture says regarding judgment. That's this kind of stuff. So, make sure that you you uh, study that passage particularly. All right. So, what we learned in this chapter, as you can see, many who challenge Christianity base their case on misinformation or error. They simply have their facts wrong. Just the facts, ma'am, is a maneuver you can use to help determine when this is happening. In this chapter, we learned how to apply the two-step approach of this tactic. Whenever a challenge is in your view, or correction, whenever a challenge to your view is based on an alleged factual claim, more blood than has been shed, or has been shed in the name of religion than for anything else, or America's founding fathers were deists, first ask, what is the precise claim? These two examples are clear, but sometimes assertions are hidden. Separate, uh, separate the precise point or points from the rest of the rhetoric. Ask questions to make sure you know what the person is alleging. This step is the same as the first step of Columbo. Next, ask yourself if the claims are accurate. There are two ways to find mistakes. The Internet is the most convenient place to do quick research. Once you have isolated specific claims, verification is often a few keystrokes away. You uh, may also have uh, reference books or informed friends you can turn to for help. You might have some time, though. By You might save some time, though, by asking a different question before you start your sleuthing. Does anything about the claim seem unlikely or implausible on its face? If a dentist claims he has filled half a million cavities in his 20-year career, you know he's confused and just do the math. Now, armed with the facts, you will be ready to address your friend's concerns. Keep in mind that when citing facts in your defense, precision is always more persuasive than generalities. Listen and read critically. Reflect on the claims and check the background information. First, tell the truth and then give your opinion. Like Detective Joe Friday, always say, just the facts, ma'am. All right, so we have reached the end of the chapter. And if you've uh, <laughs> stuck with me this whole time, you know what that means. That means that we get to celebrate. All right, we uh, got to the end. Yeah! Woohoo! <laughs> we finished the chapter. Finished the chapter. Yes, we have earned a celebration for uh, getting through these chapters together. Appreciate you guys coming out and being with me uh, during this time together. Um, we are up to chapter 17, Inside Out. So next week uh, we will be... Next we'll... Oh, I forgot to turn it off! 
Yep. All right. So make sure you subscribe. Last week I remembered. All right. So, yep. Uh, uh, so make sure you come out next week. We're uh, uh, going to be reading chapter 17, Inside Out. Uh, so we only have three chapters left of this book, 17, 18, 19. And uh, then we're going to be moving on to our next one. Hey, Nick. How you doing, man? Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so um i hope that you get uh, you've been getting things out of this uh book it, it can be uh, quite helpful um to have somebody who's uh, well versed in communication and conversation to to guide us in our in how we go about doing conversations you know uh make sure that you're doing it with grace and uh love you know, like a, a big thing about Christianity is learning, is becoming a disciple of Christ and learning what properly ordered love looks like and how to display that kind of stuff. So uh, make sure that you are listening patiently, speaking slowly and wisely and with a, a lot of grace, you know, um, and make sure that if you have any struggles or if you are um, having any doubts to make sure that you actually study that issue. You know, don't run from it. Don't hide from it. Um, if you're struggling with a problem of evil, look into it. You know, if you're struggling with the Old Testament atrocities, look into it. See what Christians have to say on the matter. You know, what they have, uh, uh, their answers to these questions. You know, um, when Jesus talks about taking the log out of your own eye in order to remove the speck from your brother's eye, it doesn't always have to be with regard to sinful things. It could be with regard to barriers to belief. And so, like, you know, um, if you are struggling with a matter and somebody else is struggling with the matter, it's better to have removed that barrier to belief yourself in your own time and your own pace than to try to do it with somebody who's struggling with the same thing. Um so I encourage you guys to, 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 to study this kind of stuff on your own and, uh, uh, and ask questions. Ask questions and seek answers. All right. Well, uh, that's it for tonight. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming out and visiting me uh, tonight. And uh, the, this uh, book study happens every Monday night, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, um, I'll see you guys later. Thank you, and uh, God bless. Hey, before you go, I hope you enjoyed today's enlightening discussion during our Christian Apologetics book study. It's always a blessing to come together to explore our faith and grow in our understanding. Your participation means the world to me, and I'm grateful for your continued support of Northeast Christian Apologetics. Remember, you can stay connected with me and access valuable resources by visiting my website, at nechristianapologetics.com. There you'll find a wealth of articles, videos, and recommended reading material to deepen your knowledge of Christian apologetics. If you're as passionate as I am about equipping believers to defend their faith and engage in meaningful conversations, you can also support this ministry in various ways. One way to support this work is through patreon.com. By becoming a patron, you'll have access to exclusive content, early access to our discussions, and a chance to connect with like-minded individuals who share your passion for Christian apologetics. If Patreon is not your style, some people prefer to give me a one-time tip. And if you'd like to do that, then feel free to do so through Venmo or Cash App. But of course, there are many ways to support me. By praying for this ministry, sharing the content on social media, or simply spreading the word about what I do. Every bit of support goes a long way in helping me fulfill my mission. Once again, thank you for joining me today. Your presence and engagement enrich these discussions, and together we're on a journey to strengthen our faith and share the good news with others. Stay tuned for more exciting book studies, thought-provoking discussions, and opportunities to grow your Christian apologetics journey. I look forward to seeing you again.